Are you wanting to create a highly prosperous photography business doing what you love? Or maybe you have a great business already and want to up your game? Then you're in the right place. Master craftsman photographer Lucy Dumas and her guests are here to support you on your journey. Now here's your hostess and tour guide, Lucy. To be nobody but yourself in a world which is doing its best night and day to make you everybody else means to fight the hardest battle which any human being can fight. And that is my absolute favorite quote. The poet is E.E. E. Cummings. And my freshman year, my English teacher had this on the blackboard big and I saw that every single day. And I, I think it really, uh, I was marinated in it, shall we say. And I think it worked. So anyway, welcome do, 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 to the 200th episode of The Profitable Photographer with Lucy Dumas. And I have something different today. Today, I will be interviewed. And it's a little uh, awkward to give up the control on my show, but I trust Kathleen Kent. And so um, I'm going to tell you a little about her in just a sec. Uh, before I do, remember that other people would probably like this show. So why don't you think about a couple people you can share it with? And also check it out on YouTube if you haven't. And if you subscribe, an angel gets her wings. <laughs> so anywho, hi, Kathleen. Hi, Lucy. Thank you so much for letting me join you today. Yes. Well, so my friend and coaching client and a colleague in the podcasting space, Kathleen, I want to tell you a little about her. Uh, first of all, she's a portrait photographer. She's an English professor. She is a coaching client of mine. So, you know, I thought maybe it would be fun to have her turn the tables and also maybe she'll share a little things that you need to know about <laughs> working with me. Shameless plug. Um, and she also has a podcast called Household Six. So first of all, I'd like to have you share what your podcast is about. Uh, thanks. So my podcast is for military spouses by military spouses. I'm an army wife of over a decade. And um, my friend Margot and I wanted to start a podcast kind of talking to our younger selves, um, all the things we wish we'd known, all the advice we wish we'd had. So um, I'd love it if uh, anybody in our military spouse world would check it out. So is there one piece of advice that you would um, always tell people right off the bat? I think it's important to be bold and um, energetic with seeking out friendships. Um, we move a lot. So it's really, really easy to be really, really lonely. Mm -hmm. And, um, my, the best advice I ever got on making friends is from my grandma. And she says, um, look around the room and find the person who looks as lonely and uncomfortable as you feel and go be their friend. And, um, that has served me well. So Kathleen and I have something in common. We're both <laughs> preacher's kids. And mm -hmm. in our coaching time that was official, we discovered that there was quite a few similarities. So that was one as well. That was something my, I don't know if it was my mom or my dad, or I just saw them do that, but um, good advice. Oh, and what, besides the moving part, what is one of the biggest challenges of being a spouse with a career of photography. Sorry, that was awkward, but <laughs> what's the hardest part of being a professional photographer if you are a military spouse besides the moving part? Besides the moving, because that would have been the first thing I said, just relocating. Um, but I think the second thing is that uh, in our community, there are a lot of hobby photographers um, because uh, military spouses are painfully underemployed. We have a 27% unemployment rate. And, um, mm. you know, so everybody finds ways to fill their time. So a lot of people will buy a camera and um, have fun taking pictures and not 
uh, maybe be up for the challenge of making it a profitable business. Mm -hmm. So um, when I first came to you for coaching, I, I remember telling you one of my biggest concerns and fears was how can I charge this amount of money when this person down the street is charging $50 and, you know, I heard somebody complaining about how this person over here charging a hundred was too expensive. And like, where is there a space for me when there's uh, someone charging so little mm-hmm. on every corner? And um, so how did you overcome that? Well, um, I mean, not how, but what did you discover or what is different? Yeah. Well, what I discovered is there's, there's room for everyone. And um when I think what I discovered is that not everyone is looking for the cheapest experience. Mm. Um, there are all these wonderful clients out there who want a professional photography experience. And I even had one client come to me and say, I had already booked with this very talented photographer. Um, she told me it was a hundred dollars. I paid her and I, I just felt sick to my stomach. I thought there's no way I'm going to get the professional portraits I want for a hundred dollars. She said, so I canceled with her. I let her keep the hundred dollars and I booked with you. And, uh, that was the best possible experience lesson because you'd been telling me up till then that people wanted professional, they wanted luxury. And, uh, that conversation and experience finally helped me believe. (laughs) I believe Um, I need to pause this one sec and And get a little light over my head. I feel like I'm in this little cave once yeah. it's later in the day than normal. So I don't have as much ambient light in this room. So to be continued, I'm back. <laughs> Did you miss me? <laughs> Always. Yeah. So um, I want to ask a little about your background and then wait, no. I'm not the guest today, Lucy. (laughs) We already know Ah! the background. (laughs) I'm so excited. So hello, everyone. I'm Kathleen Kent, filling in as host for Lucy Dumas. (laughs) And my guest today is Lucy Dumas. Um, I want to say she needs no introduction, since I'm sure you just listened to the lovely introduction to the podcast. Um, But Lucy, we get to hear a lot on the podcast about your business now and your interests now. What was the beginning of your career like though? What got you into photography? Mm. So I was, first of all, um, I was always an artist looking for my medium. Even Mm. like I colored all the time. I drew, (laughs) I, um, as I matured, I painted a little bit. I took ceramic classes and I always had a junkie camera that I could uh when I could afford to buy a roll of 12 and then process a roll of 12 (laughs) I was taking pictures and then uh I was on a date it was an out-of-town boyfriend and he had just purchased a Canon AE1 and he was cute he wasn't necessarily the smartest or sharpest crayon in the box (laughs) um and so I read the manual because I always thought professional cameras or good cameras were too complicated and I figured out how to put the film in and it was automated and the first images that I took out of that camera it was like ah, you know as as an art and then I was running a little business in the airport in San Diego um, exchanging currency which was super fun and travel insurance 1982, there was a recession. I lost the contract because I wasn't willing to have a lower, um, we'll just say commission rate. And the everything just kept pointing photography, photography, photography. I'm sure it's not unusual. Um, the positive thing in what looked fairly negative is I needed money. I needed a career. And so I, it was sink or swim. And the person that canceled my contract said, Lucy, you're going to look back on this and realize this is the best thing that ever happened to you. And she was completely right. Wow. And the other little thing, like a lot of us, I was the editor of my yearbook. I was trying to get in the band being one of those like flag bearer girls that did little (laughs) routines. And I got the mumps 
and couldn't be at the tryouts. So my brother was on yearbook. And so he, he got me in. So all these little serendipities uh, that unfolded just said, this is your career. And it's been just fascinating for 40 plus years. 1982 is when I got my license. So holy cow, been around a while. <laughs> That's really cool to hear. A question that I love asking established photographers is what what did you what choices did you make in the beginning of your business that you stand by that you think were good choices? Because mm. we all make mistakes, right? Yeah. Oh no, never. <laughs> yes, <I do. laughs> um, and my my dad was supposedly never wrong, and somebody gave him a plaque that said, I thought I was wrong once, but I was mistaken. <laughs> so it is hard for me. It's not anymore, but the whole issue of doing everything right. Um is sort of a family legacy. Okay, so what I did right and wrong? What, what you did right first, what, okay. what good choices so did you at make? At first I explored everything mm -hmm. and uh, I got a little um, part-time job. I called, I started at the back of the Yellow Pages, if anyone remembers <laughs> what that is, calling photographers to see if they needed assistance. And I found some people that needed help with weddings. I found um, a couple of people, both of them were in this program where someone went door to door selling uh, portrait gift certificates. And then they came to the studio, whichever they liked, and had their portrait, had their picture made, they might say in the South, had their portrait done. <laughs> and, um, then they tried to upsell them. And so I took a little part-time job, uh, just like eight hours a week at each one of them, doing their children and booking the bookings and doing the sales. And so I got experience. I learned in studio, it's a lot furniture moving. Mm. The lights were, I couldn't move the lights. So trying to get people at the right heights together and composed well, and comfortable and then getting the expression and, and seeing when to click, that is most of it. And then I also learned what not to do because the woman I worked with a lot, um, she just was not a very good salesperson. And mm. I actually sold more per average than anybody else that had ever had that job. Um, I also, I never actually was out on my own, but I, I took a, um, it was like training and I did sales for a company that goes door to door. They had a list of baby, of new babies. So they would go to the house, set up a little mini studio and, and come back with proofs and folios put together and sell them. And I learned this, this young man was so incredible with babies. He knew like the weirdest noises and things to get their attention. And I learned this one trick to get a baby to look at you. Do you, you want to know what it is? Yes. Okay. Let's say they're looking over here, right? Mm -hmm. You put your hand here and block their view and they're going to turn and look at you. Oh, Works like okay. So when Lucy just put her hand to the side of her face, like a horse blinder. Exactly. And now I'm going this way. Oh. Uh, noise is good. Um, anywho, so so I, in the real, in the flesh, I got myself around photographers. And it supplemented my income. I also took a, a little, like a freelance photographer for a magazine that was free called The Holistic Living News. And Sometimes they'd ask me if I had anything in, in my portfolio that they could use for an article. Sometimes they sent me out on assignments. One of them I remember was the macrobiotic restaurants and I was photographing mushrooms. And so I, I got a lot of experience in a lot of things. And, and then I realized, oh, and I joined the Professional Photographers of America and San Diego County. And I wish I had joined the county 
two years earlier. I thought you had to already be making money, but you don't. Ah. At the time, you had to be available for full-time work, which I was. Um, okay. I didn't want to make intros too long, but I guess I'm teaching some ideas here. So <laughs> always self-critical. Um, what was I saying? Uh, I Somebody told me that the fastest way to be successful is to pick a lane and go all in. Hmm. And I knew I loved weddings. I loved weddings since I was five years old. And my daddy photographed the richest person in town. <laughs> and so the dress and the candles and the food and everything was just like amazing. Uh, but she didn't photograph them, right? You said he photographed no, them. No, I mean, he sorry. Married them. He married them. He was the yeah. officiant. Okay. <laughs> yeah, my dad had a little sideline. <laughs> I think my dad wanted to be a photographer, but he wasn't very good. <laughs> but he had a good camera. <laughs> Sorry, dad. Um, anyway, so I loved weddings and I've always been a baby person. I worked in a children's store. I babysat. I'm always happy around kids. And I could see that weddings were the fastest way to get money in your pocket quickly and abundantly. Mm. So then I just put the baby photography on the side and then did what it took to learn my craft, to learn how to sell, to create products, to learn how to print. And um, we didn't edit. We let the labs do that. <laughs> but to supervise some of the editing, uh, to network, I didn't realize I was uh, the queen of networking until one day I realized, oh, I've made about 10 really good friends in this industry, including some photographers, and they're all sending me work, and I'm sending them work. Um, so. Yeah, that's what I did for 12 years. And so that was one of the things I did. Well, once I just really got a handle on photography, but I supplemented my income while learning, which was awesome. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of photographers who I know would gladly take on an assistant for free that are natural teachers like I am, like you are. Mm -hmm. And... And you can learn along the way and you can um, help someone out and, you know, all that good stuff. Anyway. I think that's good advice, though, to offer yourself for free in the very beginning, because yeah. um, I think we need to know our value. But sometimes we're we're there to gain value mm -hmm. and because um, I talked to a. a brand new photographer recently who was saying, I don't know why I can't get second shooting jobs for weddings. And uh, it was because she'd never been a second shooter for a wedding mm -hmm. or been at a wedding. So. <laughs> so your advice to her was? See if you can assist them and their second shooter for free. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, what else you got? So um, you brought up, let me see, I had some others. Okay, so one of my favorite things about you is that you're the queen of networking. You brought that up. Um, and I wanted to ask about um, the ways that you've gotten involved in the photography community. Specifically, um, I know you have a local photographer group there that you've been involved in for many, many years. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell me about starting that, connecting with those people and the value? Sure. So... When I joined the Professional Photographers of San Diego County, which is a, I guess, a chapter, an affiliate of the Professional Photographers of America, um, I, as soon as they would let me, and I have to say, and people have heard this before, but it was pretty much a man's world, and I did meet with resistance uh, for some of the people that were in leadership. So it took me a while to actually get on the board. And when I did that, then I served all the positions. So I was a committee. My first was party planning, which was awesome. And then, um, and then, and if you listen to my last week's episode, although it's actually coming out this Wednesday, but now it'll be last Wednesday because I'm a time traveler. <laughs> um, and then I got to be the print chair 
And I learned a lot by that job. And then I got to get the speakers and then I was president. And then you stay on for another month or another year. Um, and so that the experience developed my leadership. I and and the bragging rights of saying you're president of an organization or you're vice president um, or the value of of helping arrange print competition and seeing all of those and getting them ready and then listening to the judges and learning from that. There's just there's all kinds of levels of learning that you can't really quantify. So then I think you might be asking about this group. Uh, because there were a lot of things that the, the teachers, what happens with um, the local chapters is there's monthly meetings. Mm -hmm. And so there'll be speakers from everywhere. And I would ask them questions or I'd hear them speak. And a lot of the things they said weren't uh, viable for a woman. I asked so many people, what do you wear to a wedding? <laughs> and they'd say, a tuxedo. I said, yeah. What would you wear if you were me? And they'd say, I don't know. <laughs> and the other thing is there are some people who don't always tell the truth about their struggles. Mm. I think it's especially hard for men. Uh, probably not the ones listening here. You guys are all open and share everything and <laughs> can cry and, like we do. But Yeah, you guys are great. Yeah, <laughs> but there are some. And I felt like I wasn't getting the true story. And our state organization had had used to have a yearly convention. And there was a luncheon called California Women in Photography. That's how rare it was to be a woman in the industry that they had to have a luncheon for us to be together. <laughs> and friends of mine from the local PPSDC chapter said, why don't we make this a monthly event for us in San Diego? So a group of us started a, a monthly meeting for not just women photographers, because there were not very many of us, but also the spouses who were running the business. Oh. Um, and even some of the, you know, they weren't spouses, but they were the office assistants or the business managers and we would share like we had forum day where we all made let's say there were 20 of us in the group we made 20 copies of our favorite form shared it and then everybody got a copy oh that's so incredible. cool or we had the conversation about where do you what do you wear or um I did a class once on the it was a certain kind of psychology of, I don't know if it was a sales or something, but at the time I was in a lot of therapy and I used some of those things to reveal some of the challenges that relate to artists, business women, and so forth. And so at the time it was to help us all in our business. Then fast forward 15, 20 years and the group said, you know what? The world has changed. We don't need to meet for business purposes all the time. Let's expand our creative avenues. And so we we do things and it's still going. And it was started 35 years ago. That's and amazing. it's still going strong. And um, you know, it had times when it shrunk and grew, but now it's now we have a waiting list because we like to meet in each other's homes. We like to meet and create um community so we could probably have 150 members but we want it more intimate than that so we've done gallery shows we did a book we've done charity projects we, we do fun things like um have you ever seen ice um you take a pyrex pan and flowers or whatever you want to put in the ice put water, put the things in, semi-freeze it, put more water, freeze it, take it out, put it up in a window so light comes through and photograph it. Oh. Yeah. So everyone in the group is expected to um, bring something, to teach something. If 
if they're like, I don't know anything, it's like, go learn something, you know, like just that, figure out how we do that. We've done, um, this is wax. So it's a photograph that I did light and then we painted color, I painted colored wax on it. Oh, so, cool. Yeah. So we do all kinds of fun things. And um, a lot of my dearest friends are in that group. This Thursday, we're going to, um, we have a really nice aquarium in San Diego. And so I'm hosting that one. And our local camera store is uh, helping us with a contest. And so there's going to be assignments, um, different categories. One is funny face. Another one is there's something fishy going on. And then people will submit and will be judged and they'll get prizes from the camera store. So yeah. that is so cool. What yeah. What's your advice uh, to photographers who would want to start a group like that in their community? Hmm. I would say get some core people that you know are the doers like you mm -hmm. and um, that, I don't know, it find a need and then and then start having regular meetings. It, you know, it sort of was showing up as half of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. What so happened? along along those lines, um, let me say this out loud to you and then maybe we can divide it into a couple questions. Okay. Um, okay. So my questions are kind of how it it's, has always sounded to me like some of the interactions in this group kind of, um, or maybe not in this group, but in other networking kind of things led to you becoming a coach. Um, how in these situations, my, the second part of that question is where, where do you, um, where do you draw the line? Like what, what's contributing to your community and where do you think this is something I need to charge for, or, um, mm. This is something I need to hold back, maybe. With with the coaching aspect? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'm somebody that if I learn something, I want to share it. Mm -hmm. I can't help it. And <laughs> if I see, like, I, I have shared about this before, but uh, like there's this wonderful couple that calls junk. You know, they have a trailer and in the side of the trailer wooden thing says something about junk, you know, we'll haul your junk or something. And they become friends of mine because they walk their dogs and we we talk a lot. And I'm giving them like a whole coaching program <laughs> out in the middle <laughs> of the street when they didn't even ask. So it is just my nature. And I made a decision when I wasn't ready to do this as a money making experience for me because I it just sharing I, I just love it um but if someone contacted me and said I'm wondering if you do mentoring I gave them a couple of things that they had to do one of them is they had to join the professional photographers of America they had to join and attend the local chapter um I don't remember what the other things were at the time and I would see people grow, but at the same time, they weren't growing as fast. And so years ago, it's maybe nine, I was at a workshop that was about setting goals. And um, I thought my goal was to grow my business so that I got much steadier, ideal clients coming my way, where I was just fully booked all the time. And and mainly one of my weaker spots in my business is, is creating a team. I'm very independent. You know, I can do this myself. Mm. And which is weird because I was good at it at the airport. But I think because that thing was already pre-set up. Um, so anyway, I thought that that was going to be my goal was to create a team and um and at the end of the workshop, I wasn't on fire for anything. And my um, the the coach that was running the group 
asked me how it was doing because I just went outside and was enjoying the birds and different things. And I said, I feel like I need to be teaching and um, or mentoring, but I don't think I can afford to do that. And while I'm talking, I'm like <laughs> crying. And she basically said, first of all, people will learn more when you charge them enough mm -hmm. that it it's a stretch. Absolutely. Second, um, what's the second thing? The third is your heart won't be happy if you do this. Oh, second is, is coaching can be financially rewarding if you do it right. And third, mm -hmm. your heart won't be happy if you don't do that. And so just like anything that I've ever done, I just said yes to it. Back in 82, when I thought I might be a health practitioner, and when I was interviewed at the school, she said, we'd love to have you, but the truth is, you want to be a photographer. Wow. Because she asked questions like, what lights you up? And I wasn't saying, you know, watching somebody get strong and healthy and <sighs> the pain. I was like, obviously talking about photography. So, um, and I just took that as a, I'm saying yes to this. And people in both cases said, oh, you know, it's so competitive and it's so hard and all these negatives. And I, I believe in myself and yeah. I'm a person that if I'm fully committed to something, I'm going to make it happen, or at least I'm going to, I'm going to try my darndest. And if it doesn't work out, that's okay too. Mm -hmm. Did that answer your question? Yes, actually, because, um, so Lucy and I met through, uh, some of the Facebook groups that we're both in because I, um, Lucy gives a lot of free advice on the internet. Um, so follow her, join her group. Uh, but I remember I messaged her the one day and I was like, I don't know you, but I just wanted to tell you, I really appreciate <laughs> everything that you say. Like it just clicks with me. And, um, that's, uh, that's when she said, I actually offer coaching. Would you like a, a free introductory call? And, um, I kind of thought when you said that, like, well, she, she gives so much information in these comments, in these public groups, you know, what, what really is the value added signing up for the one-on-one -on -one thing? Mm -hmm. And, um, I very quickly, just from our first conversation, realized that it, your, your system is so extremely personalized. Um, and I'm, I'm going down this road trying to say that, uh, so you were asking, I, you were thinking about what, why, if I can listen to podcasts and she's got advice online, why would I? Oh, because you were talking about um, people learning more when you charge them, when the stakes are higher. Mm -hmm. um, I got so much just from the accountability and, uh, and the monthly bill being like, I've got to book somebody, I got to pay for Lucy. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we've talked about, uh, I pay for a whole year in like, two sessions because I used what you taught me. Um, but I, it, it sounds like you kind of coached yourself there in the beginning and told yourself like, this can be whatever I want it to be. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a great observation. So, yeah. Yes. I, one of the things in coaching that I, I wish I was better at this and maybe I am, and I just don't realize it is helping people discover their own inner coach. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, um, okay, so what I'll say is sometimes when someone has a challenge, because I am a natural problem solver, my mind will start creating answers and solutions. And I'll forget they've got answers inside of them. Mm -hmm. And so I'll get... I'll get, um, and you know, it's very helpful for people. Yes. And at the same time, um, like my coach and actually I'm interviewing her tomorrow, the first person, the woman that said, what else do you want to be? Um, I coached with her one-on-one -on -one after that class for a year. Uh, she, um, oh, where was I going with that? I was talking about being your own inner coach. 
Um, oh, she wasn't a photographer coach and she is someone that uh, teaches sales. She has a book called Sales Coach Now. And I did not follow the path of her normal coaching clients. She was mostly a listener while I self-coached and she was wise enough to know how to just let my ponies run and, you know, reel me back or, or kind of steer me. So, um, she could recognize when you needed a sounding board versus instructions. Yes. Because she was fully qualified to be a life coach. It's just that she has a focus, just like I have a focus, you know, it's called the profitable photographer. And another one of my big time mentors that helped me learn how to run and be a business coach or a coach, whatever kind of coach, he said, start with the business part and that life coach will just naturally come in because people who are doing something like creating a business and confronting rejection and um, you need to be self-motivated, all of those things come in. There's not like a formula where I go, here, do this exact thing. Mm -hmm. No matter what your attitude is, no matter your fears, no matter if you feel like a fake, no matter if you're a grouch, no matter if you're positive, just do this thing and you're going to be successful. But it doesn't work that way. You know, mm -hmm. so much of who we are, like wherever you go, there you are. And so learning to challenge your beliefs, like very frequently, I'm sure I did this with you at one point, uh, the fear, fear often comes up. And I'll challenge somebody about like, you know, I don't want to do this because I'm afraid. What are you afraid of? And we keep tracking back and back and back to something that's just like, oh, okay. And if that happens, then what? Oh, I'll, I'll I think you asked me many times. Okay. Well, yeah. so what happens if they do that? What happens if someone says you're too expensive? Yeah. Nothing. <laughs> they won't hire me. Okay. And if they don't hire you, you then what? Well, then I won't get paid. Okay. And then if you don't get paid, then what? And mine, Kathleen, um, because I had done this for myself, was a bit like I would track all of the fear back to, and then I'll be a bag lady. Mm. But I was at a conference one time and I think... I think we were doing like a one-on-one -on -one at round tables of a prompt, you know, like talk about your fear or something. And I said, and then I'll be a bag lady. And then I realized, oh, and if that happened, I'll handle that too. I'll yeah. find a shopping cart. I'll find a community. I'll figure out <laughs> where you get food if you're homeless. Like I'm not, not drawing this from the universe and saying, come on. Um, but I know whatever comes up, I'll handle it. You know, we've we've talked about this a lot, and I've shared this on the on the show about finding a giant tumor in my face, behind my in yeah. my sinus. Talk about worst case scenario. Yeah, and eventually, well, worst case would have been that it wasn't benign. Um, right. But I have I had to have brain surgery, and I still have discomfort from the incision ear to ear. Um, but I'm handling it and, you know, so, uh, was that a bunny trail? Yes and no. Anyway, yes, yes and no. I have confidence in myself. Yeah. So how, how did you, um, what was it like deciding, I guess, or acknowledging that you had the confidence and knowledge to confidently coach other people? Mm hmm. Hmm. Is that it? Is that a question or a statement? I'm not sure. <laughs> yes. Yeah, what, no, it's a question. Was there a moment of realization or? You know, I think I just, well, first of all, the first thing I always do is I go find education. Mm -hmm. So I checked out books from the library. I downloaded things. I, um, there's a woman named Debbie Allen, not the dancer, who is like, if anybody wants to get into this space of, uh, making income from your expertise. Um, her business is called the highly paid expert. I think Okay. highly paid expert. And she does workshops 
where it's like the ABCs of like, you could do this, you could do this, you could do this, you could do this. And, and in the middle of it, she also gave some how to be a coach options, but then, you know, I just studied and learned. And there was this part of me, just like when I realized being a photographer was something I could make happen. It, it just, as I looked at my nature and that I've always done this, mm -hmm. um, a quote I wrote down when I was in my twenties, thinking about, oh, what am I going to do with my life? And um, I was working at a children's store at the time, probably. And the quote is, in order to find your path, watch what your hand falls to naturally and keep doing that. And so in the the I'm going to be a coach. I looked at what my nature is, and I love running groups. I mean, one of the <laughs> preacher's kid benefits or curses is that we get in a lot of like Sunday school groups, and they expect us to be the facilitators a lot of times. Mm -hmm. So I had natural training for that. And, you know, my dad was basically a coach, a spiritual coach for people. And um, so it just felt like a natural fit. And, you know, there's no harm in trying it. I didn't give up photography. I just added that. And then, and then I learned. And also I'm a big believer in watching what falls your way and picking it up. And um, so, you know, books or people you meet, things like that. And it just, it fell into place. And I, I went to, actually, was this the online? No, I went to Las Vegas. Uh, the first half of the week, I was at the WPPI photography convention. And then there was a podcast convention. And so one of the classes there was talking about how to be a good interviewer. <laughs> and Kathleen, I was pretty proud of myself listening. <laughs> I realized, yeah, I do that. I I do. We can always get better, of course, but um, somehow, you know, just just by trying and doing and trying to get better at everything, I'm you know I'm a person that grows. So that's the story, and I'm sticking to that. I love that with one of the things that was really affirming about coaching too was, um, you know, I would tell you kind of my secret fears or concerns or the issues I was having with my business. Um, and you'd say, I hear that from a lot of people mm. and just kind of normalizing, like you were saying about the groups, a lot of times we're in these conversations where people aren't being honest or aren't being vulnerable. Um, and, and so coaching was an opportunity to kind of get a window into what other people are thinking too. Mm -hmm. um, so what are some of the recurring um, pieces of advice that you end up giving to your clients? Gosh, that's a big one. Yeah. Um, well, feel the fear and do it anyway is, you know, a mantra of mine. And I pass that on. Um, people take things so personally, mm -hmm. like, we're a kid and we're saying, I made this for you. Do, do you like it? And then if you don't respond, then I take it as there's something wrong with me. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. And so one of the things I talk about a lot and I help people get over is, is that your work and whether someone wants it or not has nothing to do with you and your value as a human or as an artist, it's a product. And if I found someone who likes the product I create and they decide to buy it, it's a business decision. It's not an affirmation that I am a worthy person to draw breath on this planet. Mm. And um, kind of like unto that, <laughs> using Bible language, is um, that... Oh gosh, I, your little cutie was about to walk in, right? Sorry. And I was like, oh, there she is. 
I love your daughter. I can't wait to meet her in person sometime. Yes. Okay. Like unto that is, oh, so what was I saying? Oh, taking it personally. Um, It just flew away. I'm sorry. That's why I was like, no, go away. No, no. <laughs> that's <okay. laughs> yeah. Um, that's, that's really good, yeah. heavy stuff though, because I think when your business is just you, um, yeah. it's really, it, I mean, that's probably the biggest challenge is not making it all personal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's that either the imposter syndrome, you know, people say that a lot. It's, it's the good enough. I'm not good enough. And the truth is most people who are very, very profitable are not creating incredible art and selling it to their day-to-day -day portrait clients. Mm -hmm. High percentage of people that you see getting degrees with the Professional Photographers of America and, and getting all of their print cases they enter going long and doing these spectacular images, that's personal work. So we don't have to be award-winning, magnificent, internationally famous photographers to be creating photographic products that people treasure. And even though I've like, been around a while, so I've popped into some people's houses on occasion that I photographed, you know, 25 years ago, and I see the images on their wall and they're like, oh, I just love that. And I'll be like, and, and I took the picture and I'm like, oh, I'm so I don't. <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm, <laughs> did I do that? But, but for them, you know, but, so this is the other side of the, of the coin of this is we're not selling ourselves. We're selling their love back to themselves. It's kind of an unfair advantage. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, show me what you value most. I'm going to take a picture of it. And then you're going to give me money for that picture. Mm -hmm. It's kind of cheating. So, <laughs> so if we trust and know, you can trust and know it's not about us at all. Now, yes, the third side of that coin is they really are buying us in terms of the decision they make mm -hmm. that um, it's, it's a lonely world out there and people love to be served. People love to have relationships, even the, even the more introverted people. Um, and so that time they get to be with us and be noticed by us. I mean, nothing feels better than to have somebody really, really see you, right? Mm -hmm. And when we're photographing, if it's family portraits or executive portraits or, you know, whatever, as photographers, we're taking the time to see them. And then we're recording what we see. And then they get to see what we see. Yes. That's my favorite reaction at a reveal is when someone looks at the portrait and says, that looks like me mm. and I love it. Mm -hmm. um not oh I look fat oh I'm so wrinkledy oh that's a pretty picture but that's me that's mm -hmm. how I see myself and we get to do that yeah we do I've lost my little zoom clicker again it keeps moving around where are you Kathleen <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to get more light on my face but it's it's not working I, you look good on my end imperfectly perfect right mm -hmm. <laughs> But you look so pretty with your greens and hey, Thank you. so tell me about my little process or ask me about my process of branding. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. One of the most surprising things for me, um, I think about our coaching was when you were like, oh, have we done personal branding yet? Just kind of offhand. And I was like, uh, no. And you, you kind of, I saw your face change, like your voice, you're like, Oh, here we go. Mm -hmm. um, I love doing so this. Tell us about uh, your strategy for, for building a personal brand. Okay. So a personal brand is about finding the essence of you. 
and then communicating it in a way that your ideal clients will respond to. And because there's only one of us in the whole world, the, the path to personal branding starts with a deep um, introspective process, at least the way that I do it, and a craft project and asking people that know you and care about you some key questions. So the first thing I do is have you create what I call an identity map. And you get magazines, all kinds of magazines, and clip out what visually grabs you. Not, this is not a um, a dream board. Not a vision board. No, you're not picking your trip to Hawaii and those things. You're just something, you're just like, oh, I like that. Oh, that's pretty. Oh, I like that. Gluing it on a board, and it's important that it's actually physically done because the way you position them, even the way you cut out the pictures and how you lay them out, it tells me graphically a lot. And in that, every single person that's done that has a completely unique color palette and there's textures and there's design elements. So like yours, and you see your beautiful banner in the back, we, uh, it was so clear that there were these high-end tropical colors that you loved and you love leaf things. And I have uh, my clients clip out um, words and, and phrases that they like the look of, not fonts, but, but graphic design using letters. And um, then I'm not the graphic artist, but you can take that to an artist and you've got visuals. Okay, at the same time, I do this uh, little visualization where we go back to your childhood and some other questions and we we kind of unearth the essence of who you are that you've always been and always will be. Which it was so emotional, um, which I hadn't expected, so... <laughs> like so you'd be like are you there on the phone and I'd be like yeah I'm just crying <laughs> <laughs> one of my clients um because one of the questions is about your favorite book and she realized because she already had a really strong style with with um doing some art photography of pets and she realized her creative style was an homage to the book series she loved when she was a kid Oh, and she didn't goodness. realize it till this process. Okay, so we do this cool process. And out of that, I help you kind of reclaim, remember, um, re-energize who you are, because that's who people experience mm -hmm. and always have and always will. And then I have you ask um, to post to describe you in three words and not things you could say about all of us, like she's creative, but something deeper. And so out of that blossoms this, um, this core uh, material to understand yourself so you can understand who or how to have people realize who you are. Does that make sense? I mean, I know it makes sense. Did I explain yes. it in a way that... I think so. So what, mm -hmm. what Lucy had me post was kind of, I'm working with a business coach. We're working on my brand identity. I'm, I'm looking for what are three words you would use to describe me is the gist of, of what I posted. Mm -hmm. And it really was surprising how many people, um, commented the same things. It was really affirming and encouraging and, um, surprising, uh, great confidence booster, but it, it was something that I never would have done just out of nowhere mm -hmm. yeah and what's funny is both of those the two of the activities were just things that came to me I was at um I've talked about Ken Whitmire on this show he uh, has passed away and I wish he could be on the show but mm -hmm. um he he did a workshop for decades uh the wall portrait conference and I attended in 2010 because I realized he wasn't going to be around forever and I wanted to not miss out on that. How are we doing on our time? Okay, we're good. <laughs> and 
he started to realize I was somebody that knew some stuff about some stuff. Mm -hmm. I was doing all this branding coaching conversation. I was not a coach at the time, 2010. So that's 13 years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, I, he has these little workshop, like the last two days, there's like pods. And so you go a half hour, you know, a group of 10 go for a half hour, this one, one teacher, and then you rotate around. And he had some open spaces. And I asked if I could, um, you know, teach something. And he said, sure. <laughs> and like at four in the morning, this whole thing came to me that ask these questions and do these things. And then the next day, the part two came to me. So it was just like a, a download that I was like, oh, that really worked well. And people like they shared and they cried. And when it's in a group, there's some cool things that I do where people get to feel really affirmed and connected. So I have people in the group share because they've just spent a week together. So I have mm. each person share three words that describe you, you them. Mm -hmm. And um, and then the cool thing is I got to have everybody tell me the three things. And so that was very affirming for me too. Anyway, so I guess the moral of that story is be open to things and and let your light shine, shine, shine. You know, trust that you have so much more in you than you can possibly imagine. And it's an endless well of creativity and giving and heart and all that good stuff. And, and those are the things that make us unique so that even when you are in a neighborhood with five other photographers, like I am, mm -hmm. um, you can stand out and find the clients that are that you can serve the best. Right, right. My little neighborhood in South Park, which um, it's funny because before Kathleen and I met, she was in San Diego. Uh, you were on a layover? I was there. I had photographed a wedding and I was just kind of messing around before my flight. And I, right now I live in a very small town in the middle of nowhere and we don't have a Target. So, you know, I'm in San Diego. I've already done the touristy things, but I'm like, I just want to go walk around Target. So I got an Uber, I put in Target in the map and it brings me to this little tiny baby Target. That's like, it's like a Target stand almost. Mm -hmm. um, but I found out later that it's right around the corner from Lucy. So I walked her all around her neighborhood, just kind of killing time on my afternoon. Um, and yeah. We so probably waved at each other. We probably did. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I sidetracked myself on that, but um, yeah, it the thing is too. So now, if I wanted a high volume studio, mm -hmm. then I would take that part of me that I know is always going to come through with everything I do, and I would use words and colors and textures and design that appealed and communicated. This is on the budget side, or you can take it and be super luxurious or you can go somewhere in the middle. So um, yeah, and colors, oh, I just love the meanings of colors. Colors have meaning, combinations of colors have meaning, tones of colors together. And that's where a really good graphic artist who has studied branding can take information like we've talked about and turn it into something that doesn't look like anyone else's. So, yeah. But at the same time, one of my, um, I think one of the people that's been on this show has said, we're not Coca-Cola. We don't have to have the absolutely perfect branding yeah. to be successful. I, I was between branding for a long time and still was working. This is pre, pre internet, but I was working all the time. But I have to say, then when I did the branding journey, and got my logo and my colors and my whole concept, like instantly when people would call me, they'd already seen it. And they were almost always at least half sold. So I saw the difference. Mm -hmm. But I still had a thriving business when my branding 
wasn't that great. So, yeah. What, um, what surprised you about your interactions with your coaching clients? Besides hmm. what we've already talked about. What surprised me? What surprises me at first is how willing people are to share so deeply, so quickly. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think you need to give yourself credit for that because you create a very welcoming environment. Thank I you. felt very comfortable sharing with Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've just been tickled by watching people, especially when they, like one thing that that I have gotten more um, clear about is my sales process and mm -hmm. that concept that you know well, the trusted advisor, and that I didn't realize that that's what I've always done photographically is get people to know and like and trust me and let me be in charge you know and relax into my leadership and that my step-by-step -step system and a few little secret sauces in the sales room um, that that structure is teachable and <laughs> the people who have done like remarkably well right off the bat often are people who haven't done sales at all and so they don't have any resistance. They just do exactly this. Uh, one of my clients, he didn't even have a business when we started. And I had him do free work to build his portfolio. Um, I think sometimes, oftentimes, it's better to work for free and practice sales. And sure, if they want to buy something, great, but give them something than having, well, definitely than doing shoot and share model. Anyway, his first actual sale would have been $4,000, but we hadn't gotten to the wow. point of how to close a sale. Wow. So it, it still was 2000 His first That's one. That's amazing. Wow. And, and he would admit they were not, you know, they were good sellable photographs. They weren't like the most, most uh, mind blowing, mind blowing. And in his portfolio, he definitely has work that was stronger in his portfolio but it was just two women and their dogs and they love the dogs and they love the pictures and he's just a wonderful young man so they loved him and they so they paid it was two thousand and then they also prepaid another session something like eight hundred dollars towards the next wow. session because he didn't know what he didn't know so he just did the thing <laughs> So it, that's, this is funny because that was going to be another question I wanted to ask is, uh, you know, I've talked to people who say like, well, I haven't done enough to hire a coach. Like I would be embarrassed. I've got nothing to show. I have, I, my business isn't established and you just told the perfect antidote as to why it's awesome to just go ahead and go for it. Yeah. Yeah. I've had many clients where we just started from scratch and they didn't even know what they wanted to do. And then we began to unearth what they loved and what they're already kind of thinking about and then I've worked with them on both their photography and their brand of course and how to sell it and how to find people that want that and then I've had people that have been around a long long time and they want to up their game a little bit or a lot and um you know I because I guess I don't know if it surprises me. There's some things on the, like, I consistently see people hold back because of fears. Mm -hmm. And I can see consistently, like I started having people fill out what I call a time card and keep track of, of their work and what they're doing with their time. And it's pretty consistent that the people that are not really putting in the time are not getting very many results. Mm -hmm. And the people that just dig right in and do the things and come up with their own ideas and are not just waiting for me to tell them what to do. All right, next. Okay, so I know that people have a lot of objections to hiring a coach. Probably, usually, I can't afford it, to which I would say you can't not afford it. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but are there situations where you tell people like, you know, I agree with you, maybe you're not 
in a good place or ready for a coach right now? Mm -hmm. Like what? <laughs> I was going to try to psych you out and just say, yes, <laughs> and then <laughs> so if someone doesn't have the time to devote or they're not really all in, mm -hmm. um, it, now nobody really feels like they have the time, but there are people who don't, um, you know, their life circumstance is such that they just are either not able or not willing to devote the time to it. Mm -hmm. um, I had one, I would consider this a very successful coaching session where we spent a fun six months together. Um, I taught him, you know, the, the program, the sales, and we talked about marketing. And this was a person that had a tech job that he really enjoyed, but he also loved photography. And near the end, he told me, Lucy, this has been so great because what I've learned is I don't want to run a photography business. I want to be an artist and I love my other job. And so mm. it was successful from his standpoint. Um, so, you know, sometimes our, our passion can be our passion if we have something else that serves us well. But um, I've had people where I thought, wow, I wonder if they're going to make this work. And they've just been like the, I don't know, the ever ready bunny and they just go for it. And voila, they, um, you know, like the, the person I was mentioning that didn't even have a business yet. And um, yeah, so some people really surprise me in that way. And then some people you know, just everybody's so different. But what I think is all forms of education are always worth it because number one, it grows our brains. It grows our awareness of the world. And like no one can, like with my business coach that I already mentioned, at the end of our period, I was in no way near where I wanted to be eventually, but that foundation um, was so solid that then like, it's a, it's like a ripple in a pond. The impact just keeps rippling and rippling. So you just never know um, what any form of education is doing to help change who you are and your knowledge base. Mm. Yeah, that was a long way around the are some people <laughs> not, huh. not ready for it but yeah some yeah and yeah that's all I have to say that's enough we're almost out of time what else you got so here, let me run down the other things I have written down just um oh actually no I do have a good question um why did you start the podcast ah, okay so I did say this is the 200th episode at the beginning. Yes. Right? Okay. <laughs> 200. Congratulations. Yeah. So I noticed that. Um, so I started becoming a guest on podcasts. It started with Charles Lewis years ago before, you know, when I was mentoring as a service to the world and the reward was the joy of helping people, which is still the joy. And and then anyway, I started to see that a great way for people to know about me as a coach was to be on a podcast. So I went to this big workshop where it, it was about getting on shows, teaching you how to do it. Um, there were 40 podcasters there and a hundred people that were pitching their shows. But during that week, the, his name is Steve Ulsher. He said to me, and also there were a lot of, there were like pre-classes and after classes. And he would say, Lucy, I think you need a show. I really think you need a show. And I was like, Steve, you're trying to sell me your stuff, aren't you? Because <laughs> he, you know, he's a producer of shows too. And he's like, I just know that this is something that you would be really good at. And then 
And then coincidentally, on my way home from that, which it was in Florida, WPPI was starting at the end of that event. So I just parachuted off the plane over Las Vegas instead of going all the way to San Diego. <laughs> anyway, I changed my ticket and I went to WPPI. And there was a little group of people that I knew well professionally. And I asked a couple people, should I have a podcast? And they said, 100%, absolutely. There's no voice like yours. A woman that's been around a long time, you know, yeah. there is a need for what you offer. And another person just said like, oh, hell yeah. And, you know, I got those threes, things come in threes. And so I put it together because I always have loved a good conversation. And I've always been able to pull out a lot from people in a conversation mm -hmm. because I'm so curious. I'm curious about <laughs> everything, you know? So, yeah. And then he talked a lot about the dangers of pod fade. So whenever I think, oh, should I really be doing this? Because it, it isn't like, you know, first of all, it's a labor of love. Right now I'm paying for the production and um, someday soon, I'm going to start soliciting for sponsors, mm -hmm. but it, it, basically it's a gift I'm giving and yes, yeah. I get rewards back. And, um, hopefully there's some people listening to this show that would like to take me up on uh, one of my free, uh, strategy sessions to help you dig deep into your dreams and some challenges. Um, but, uh, where was I going? Sometimes Kathleen knows this. Sometimes I interrupt, interrupt myself <laughs> with the <laughs> thought and I go down a bunny trail. So the question was why? Um, oh, pod fade. So I, yes. whenever I think, oh, should I keep doing this? I keep hearing, no, I don't want pod fade. I'm not going to be one of those. And um, yeah. And it's funny, Kathleen, um, couple of nights ago, because I'm kind of a person that can be cluttery. And as a person that was doing photography and all kinds of other creative activities, I'm, I'm like a boat going forward in the wake in the back. I'm not that worried about. But <laughs> recently, since my mom passed, I d did a lot of getting rid of things and decluttering. And I've noticed my house stays pretty manageable these days and I was like oh that's because I'm not creating but then my inner coach said Lucy you're creating you're just not physically creating albums and photographs and painting and yes. you know whatever else um, I'm not cooking quite to the extent there's so many things you can do with things that are already almost prepared <laughs> Instead, so, you're educating, you're talking, you're recording, you're connecting. Right. I'm creating content. Yes. <laughs> yes. And hopefully I'm changing lives and hopefully, hopefully I'm inspiring people and, um, and I'm supporting my guests because like, I bet there's some military spouses out there going, I need a Kathleen and I need to listen to her show. <laughs> and, and I hope they can listen to household six, but it, it sounds like for me, I kept having the same conversations in real life and on the internet. And I thought, I want to talk, I want to have this conversation with everybody yeah. at once. And so uh, the podcast kind of gives me a way to do that. And I think it sounds like it gives you a way to, to coach the world. Mm -hmm. And it makes me so happy that like in 85 countries, people are tuning in. So that's amazing. I had a, a mentor that told me, Lucy, someday you're going to be doing what I'm doing worldwide. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and, and then when I noticed that this was in like 20 countries, going back in the first four, five months, I was like, oh, I'm worldwide. worldwide. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think I, I don't like, I love supporting other people. And I, I don't think as much about the fact that by having other coaches and teachers and mentors and and just darn smart people, I'm helping them get their message out to the world too. So yeah. it's just a good fit. So 
so I, you've had 200, so I know it's going to be hard. Um, but what are your favorite episodes? Oh, gosh. Which ones come to mind? Okay, Arthur Rainville. Okay. It's all about creativity. This is a man with the biggest heart in the world. Um, Jeffrey Shaw, I had to split it into two mm -hmm. because there, it was so good. And my dear friend who passed away a um, year and a half ago, maybe, it was during COVID times, not from COVID. She, we knew she was terminal with cancer. And she was one of the first people I got on my show because her wisdom, her passion, her creativity, her strength as a human being, the way she inspires others, I wanted that documented. And hopefully that lives on for all time. So those are those are three um, that come to mind. Um, so many, so many. Um, yeah. Is well, there... Is there anything you've ever said in one of your episodes that you published that now you would argue with yourself or delete <laughs> or regret? <laughs> I'm sure there's one every time. I don't know. I can't really answer. I'd have to think about that one. So. Okay. okay. Well, yeah. that's, that's probably good. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's all, everybody that knows me on Zoom knows I'm all about getting my bangs right. So I regret some hairdos and, <laughs> and, and not getting my eye makeup right. Uh, I'm kind of vain. So yeah, well, that is, man, we have had a good long conversation and I don't know why I was nervous. You did such a good job, Miss Kathy. Well, and thank you for handing over the reins. Um, I can't wait to share this with everybody. And, uh, for your audience to get to learn a little bit more about you. Yeah. There she is. So I want to ask you um, what your... <laughs> she brought me pie. Like, oh, I need pie now. What kind of pie? Strawberry rhubarb. Oh, is that your favorite? Because yeah. it's my favorite. Plain old rhubarb is, but strawberry rhubarb will do as a second choice. Absolutely. Um, so if there's one thing, and maybe I already asked it, but one thing that was the most powerful lesson for you about oh that's a good question let me shut this because i'm getting some noise it's good the most powerful about coaching or our relationship or just something you know it could have come from you not not from us but something that has really impacted you in this relationship oh well Lucy and I have a special relationship. If you know um, me, I call her my future self. Uh, we have so much in common. And so, uh, you know, we got to bond as mentor mentee, but, you know, I think we've got, we've got a sisterhood too. Mm -hmm. um, so like I, I think I brought up earlier, it was so affirming to hear that I wasn't alone mm -hmm. in all of my fears and insecurities. Um, I think like through the coaching process, I, you know, you gave me your whole business system and we worked on all of that, but it also was very much a life coaching, uh, kind of thing. And, um, I, I gave a friend advice a while back and she said, is this from your photographer friend? Because <laughs> she always gives the best advice. And I was like, yeah. Oh. <laughs> um, so I think there were kind of some overarching themes of the conversations that we have had um, that that changed the way I approach challenges and the mm. way I think of myself. Mm. I think that um, I think uh, I'm a lot gentler with myself. Mm. I think I you've you've helped me work to look at myself objectively like from the outside okay what's the worst that's going to happen if your fear comes true what's the mm -hmm. um so so I've created I've created a life that works for me better mm -hmm. um and uh I've given myself a more generous um a, more, a gentler space to be okay. in. yeah yeah we sense? have to be our best friends we're the one person that will never leave us yeah and 
And um, there's this part of us that's, they call it the silent witness, that, you know, our thoughts are what create emotions and reactions mm -hmm. and actions. And we're always free to change those thoughts. But we have to be aware of them. Mm -hmm. So if we're noticing, I guess this would be like, if I could say one thing I'd like people to ponder um, is cultivating that witness. Like if you have a yucky feeling, see if you can track back to when it started and then coach yourself out of that or change your thought on it. Like if there's somebody that all of a sudden you're mad and you realize, Oh, because that person uh, took my place in line at the grocery store. <laughs> I've I've had that where I'm like all of a sudden, and then I notice what was I? Why do I feel so yucky? Oh, because that happened, and and then I release them and allow that, and know that it it just didn't matter, and maybe there's some force that was trying to slow me down so that I could run into a friend or avoid an accident or something. So yeah, yeah. And that kind of concept, I think is why I'm choosing words like generous and gentle, um, approaching problems with the most generous possible spirit. So yes. Yes. what, what's, what are these clients motives? Are they trying to get one over on me? No, they're probably just asking a question. Like in the Facebook groups, it comes up a lot. Somebody will be like, somebody asked for a military discount. What do I do? Um, do I have to give them a military discount? And <laughs> as a military spouse, I know like, no, I just, I'm, I'm asking because some people give one, yeah. um, but you can just say no. And uh, I think somebody knocked something over in my house and I lost yeah. my train of thought. Uh, anyway, yeah, <laughs> I get it. That you realize we're at choice of how we react and we need to be conscious of, of how we're reacting and yeah. being gentler. I love that gentler with ourselves and others mm -hmm. working to, to let go of judgment and just be in the present of what is, and the things don't always mean what we think they mean. So yes. anyway, well, we're way over time. I hope some people have listened to the end, but you know, <laughs> we could talk a lot and we are going to, because we're going to meet up for a little vacation soon. Yeah. Oh, thank you so, so much. And so again, how do people get in touch with you if they have questions? So I am Kathleen Kent Photography on Facebook and Instagram, and also the Household Six podcast. Um, we're on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, anywhere you listen. Cool. And I'm so excited you put up that, that banner because I hadn't seen that before. <laughs> so pretty. And so you. <laughs> All right. Well, that's it. Uh, ta ta for now. All right. Bye, Lucy. You have been listening to the Highly Profitable Photographer with Lucy Dumas. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please rate, subscribe, review, and share. To connect one on one and learn more about our coaching programs, just go to lucydumascoaching.com. Until next time, go have fun photographing and selling your work.